Today's lecture 32. Quite a lot to do today. You're going to want to make sure you're really paying attention well and you'll be quizzed on this material. Um, but a lot of it is review or you should be spending time thinking about what we've talked about so far and putting it into the context of some new things as well. So in lecture 32a, we'll do more motion. We'll talk about approximating distance travel or changing position with what are called Riemann sums. Okay, a particular kind of actual summation. Fundamental theorem of calculus, motion and vectors that will continue into lecture B. I'm going to, again, do some review. You know, we did some review on Monday. We'll do some review today, heading into exam three next week. So I'm going to review the extreme value theorem and optimization on closed intervals. And then at the end, five to 10 minutes or so, we'll do flows and flow rates purely on mathematical with that one. I don't have anything in the power. Let's go back to the non-constant acceleration example from lecture 31b. That was on Monday. That was this velocity. Okay. V of t is the velocity. It's going to be the derivative of f. f is going to be the really position function, you might say. And it's better to call it position instead of distance traveled, though those can be equal to each other if you're just traveling in one direction. Uh, direction, which we actually would be here. So distance traveled and position would be the same here. And I am assuming I'm going to start at position zero. Why is the initial position? And again, I will be showing you some mathematica animations here where the motion will be along a vertical y-axis. So I think y is the best choice here. And f of t is my name of my function. On the three blue, one brown videos, he called the position function s of, s of t, which I think I mean, it's common to use it, but it's a little confusing because it makes you think speed. But it was actually a position function in those videos. But I'm calling it f of t. y equals f of t is the position. This is the positive y direction upward. The negative y direction would go downward. And zero could be there somewhere, and you could, the motion could go underground, so to speak, if zero is at the ground level. Initially, let's address the question here of why is the distance traveled, or again, that's going to be the same as the position here, equal to t cubed. I've said it's the area under the curve, and you're just trusting me on that as well, but why is it equal to t cubed? Why that particular antiderivative of the velocity? <coughs> Integrate 3t squared as an antiderivative, you'll get t cubed plus c. Why do we get it t cubed, and why is c zero? As well. What I'm about to show you is not a rigorous argument. Okay? It's intuitive and in fact it involves infinitesimals. Infinitesimals come back with integrals, just like we talked about them with derivatives. In fact, you might even say understanding infinitesimals intuitively is more important with integrals than with derivatives. <clears throat> intuitively, we think of the integral symbol as representing adding or summation. And in our imaginations, it's actually an infinite summation. And that's how Leibniz thought of it when he first introduced integral notation. The integral sign is kind of like an S. And in fact, if you look at the early writing of Leibniz and other people, they wrote it to actually look a little bit more like an S. But then over time, it's become a little bit more stylized, you might say. And maybe they did want to avoid making people think it was actually the letter S. But it does kind of look like an S. And Leibniz and others thought of it as summations. And Newton thought of it that way too. He just didn't use the same notation. If it's an infinite sum, what is it added? Of what? Of infinitesimal distance. Remember, when you're going at a constant speed, a constant rate, distance equals rate times time. The big thing with calculus is what do you do when you're not traveling at a constant speed? But in this equation I'm about to show you, I want you to pretend the speed is constant. And distance that I'm calling dy equals rate times time. I'm using the letter u here for time because that's the letter used in that integral. 
Again, u is just a dummy variable. It doesn't mean anything, really. Though I could effectively down here think of it as time. I could have used t's as well. Don't let the distinction between t and u here bother you. It is important up in the integral that you put the t in the upper limit of the integral. And changing the variable to something else in the integrand just re-emphasizes that the true variable for this quantity is the upper limit of the integral. That's the idea of sliding the t back and forth or, or just letting it increase as time goes by. Changes the area and so it changes the value of the integral. It really gives you a function of t and a to the root. Think of this rate as constant. Think of u as some fixed number. And you imagine it changing an infinitesimally tiny amount by e. This would be effectively a constant rate over a really tiny small inter interval, infinitesimally small interval. Which makes sense. Over a super tiny amount of time, even if you're in your car and you hit the accelerator, so you're speeding up, over an infinitesimally small amount of time, your speed is effectively constant because it's such a small amount of time. So this is a rate that's constant times a tiny amount of time to give you a tiny amount of distance. And for this function, we can write it that way too. Because the speed function, the velocity function is 3t squared or 3u squared if you use u. The definite integral then says that the total distance is the sum of the individual distances. Why the total distance traveled is the sum of the dy's. The infinitesimally small distances traveled over all these infinitely many infinitesimal time intervals that go by. The integral, you imagine you're adding those things. And ultimately, you imagine you're adding these things. Add up the values of 3u squared times du. Now, I put the word times in there on purpose, OK? When you're thinking about the integral, you can pretend you're multiplying these two things. That's not literally what's happening. You're not literally multiplying 3u squared and du. And effectively, when we talk about that notation, technically speaking, when you put the du there, that's just emphasizing that you integrate with respect to u. But intuitively, you can pretend it's multiplication, and the integrals are is an adding. And that's how Leibniz thought of it. That's why he used this notation, even though it's not technically correct. That's the kind of thing that happens with infinitesimals, as you've seen. But why do we get t cubed in the end, or u cubed, if you prefer? Well, if dy is 3t squared dt, I decide to switch back to t here, then divide both sides by dt, dy dt is 3 squ t squared. So I'm looking for a function whose derivative is t, 3t squared, t cubed plus c. But then take c to be 0 so, so that y is 0 over t is 0. Is this a proof? Does this confirm why the answer has to be t cubed? No, it's not. It's not a rigorous mathematical proof. So if you're feeling like, does that really work in the gut of your stomach, in the pit of your stomach, that's understandable. It's just a, an intuitive justification. It's how scientists, engineers, high-level finance people, economists, it's how they think about integration. And this intuitive perspective is really the key to seeing other applications of integration. And if you take calculus too, we'll do plenty of other applications of integration. That's a big part of calculus, too, is lots of other applications. And thinking about this way, if this way is the key to understanding why the integral gives you the answer that you seek. Okay? That's the intuitive justification. The integral is like adding. We're adding up these tiny distances that can be represented as distance time, as rate times time. But that allows us to solve for y because we can say that means the derivative of the position with respect to time, the velocity, is 3t squared. And so we're really just after an antiderivative of that. And then take c to be 0 for this example so that y is 0 and t is 0. If it were a different example, 
C might not be zero. Like if I said y is one when t is zero, then I'd actually want to take C to be one. It wouldn't be a distance traveled, then there would really be a position for studying at y equals one. Okay? This is not easy. It's something you've got to get used to just by thinking about it a lot. By the way, this is also helpful for the units of the answer. The units do have to be, say, in meters for the distance traveled. The rate is in meters per second. The time is in seconds. This 3t squared, even though it's got a t in it, you want to imagine as being meters per second. It's the entire product, 3t squared, that has units of meters per second. dt is a time, a tiny amount of time. It has units of seconds. The product has the seconds canceling, giving you units of meters units of distance or position. Sure. Alternatively, to try to figure out why the answer is t cubed, we can be more rigorous and take what's called a Riemann sum approximation of the area, which would also be an approximation of the distance traveled, using areas of rectangles, like you saw in the three blue one brown video, if you watched it, which you should have. Okay, You're really, really going to get a lot out of those if you watch them and think about them carefully. And then, to be sure why the answer is t cubed, we take a limit as those approximations, as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. So limits are involved, technically speaking. <coughs> Integrals, just like derivatives, are based on limits. <coughs> if you take calculus two, there's also something else involving limits called infinite sequences in series. So limits is at the heart of every topic in calculus. So far, we've been treating area as intuitive. I understand the intu intuition behind area. But if you think about it deeply, area is actually not that. It's not real clear how to define what area truly is. Volume's a little bit more clear, right? You gotta wanna figure out the volume of some object? Well, fill a bathtub with water, not all the way to the top, but partially, and then drop the thing in the water, how much volume gets displaced, okay? You can sort of imagine that two-dimensional fluid, and we'll actually have it in, in class today, but area is it's not a, an easy thing to define. So now we're going to approximate the area, which also approximates the distances, with rectangles, and then let n, the number of rectangles, go to infinity. Let n be a positive integer, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. We are going to be thinking about the same example here. Our interval in question is 0 to 2. We're about to break up that interval into a bunch of pieces. It's called a partition. n is the number of pieces, ultimately the number of approximated rectangles. What if n were 8, for example? I want to break this interval from 0 to 2 up into 8 pieces of equal length. How long would each piece have to be? Well, just take 2 divided by 8. 1 fourth was 0.25. Here would be 1, that's breaking it up into two pieces. Here's 0 0.5 and 1.5, that breaks it up into four pieces. Then I have four more spots that breaks it up into eight pieces. This is 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 1.25, 1 1.75. <clears throat> this would be if n is 8. But in the theory, n can be any positive integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Given the interval, a to b, in this case 0 to 2, define a positive step size that we're going to call delta t, not dt. We are going to think of dt as always being infinitesimally small. Delta t is not infinitesimally small. It could be small, just not infinitesimally small. There's no rigorous definition for us about what the difference is between those two things. It's all intuitive. B minus A over N, the length of the interval divided by the number of pieces. In this case, again, A is 0, B is 2. B minus A is 2 minus 0, 2. Divided by N is 8 is 1 fourth or 0.25. If N were 16, then delta T would be 0.125. 2 divided by 16 is 1 eighth or 0.125.
We're going to do it in general here. For each i from 0 to n, let t sub i equal a plus i times delta t. So what is this formula giving us? It's giving us some numbers, a list of numbers, n plus one of them actually, since I'm starting at i equals 0. When you plug in i equals 0, you get a plus 0, a. t sub 0 is the same thing as a. When you plug in i equals 1, right there, t sub 1 is a plus 1 times delta t, a plus delta t, right there. When you plug in i equals 2, t sub 2 is a plus 2 times delta t, which is what you see right there. Uh, that funny thing is supposed to be dot, dot, dots. Once again, it didn't show up going from my Mac to my PC, to the PC here. Those are supposed to be dot, dot, dots there. I always forget that happens. Meaning, et cetera, up through t sub n. If you replace i with n, you get a plus n times delta t, but that simplifies to b. Because delta t is b minus a over n. The n's divide out, leaving you with a plus b minus a. Then the a's cancel, leaving you with b. All I'm doing here is I'm just labeling, coming back to this picture over here, I'm just labeling these points. In this picture, a is 0, which is also t sub 0. The first point here is t1, this is t2, this is t3, this is t4, t5, t6. T7 right here, and then B is T8. But if N were 16, I'd have T0 through T16. What do we want to do now? We want to find an area of an approximating rectangle. Approximating what? Approximating the area under the curve. So here's the curve. Which curve? The velocity, v of t, or f prime of t if you prefer, which is 3t squared. I want to approximate this area, because that's going to give me the distance traveled at least, well, now to a fixed endpoint 2 instead of an arbitrary endpoint t. The approximate distance traveled over this interval of time, I'm going to approximate by doing rate times time, where the rate is evaluated at the right end point of the interval. This is a t sub i here, not a t sub i minus 1. When i is 1, the interval is from t0 to t1, the first interval, right here. Plug its right endpoint into the velocity function and multiply times delta t. Rate times time is an area on this graph. It's an area of this rectangle right here. Where that point right there has a second coordinate equal to v of t1. When i is 1. That product is going to be the area of the rectangle which you can see over approximates the area under the curve when t goes between 0 and 0.25. It's a bit too big because the curve is increasing. When t is 2, the interval is t1 to t2. I plug in t2 into v and do rate times time. To get an area of a rectangle, what rectangle? This one right here. So the second coordinate of this point here is v of t2. When n is 3, excuse me, when i is 3, I go from t2 to t3. And I plug t3 into the velocity to get the approximate rectangle. t3 is 0.75. So it's this right rectangle that approximates the area. The second coordinate there is v of t3. Etc. 
I find all those products to find all these areas that I'm drawing here. And I get an approximation to the area I'm going to graph. It's too big. That's okay, I can make it better by letting n get bigger. More rectangles. Which makes delta t smaller. If n is bigger, delta t will be smaller because I'm dividing by n. Well, I get more rectangles and they all get skinnier and skinnier. And you get better and better approximations to the area under the curve. For a given small delta t, one of the rectangles might look like that. And you can see now you're just barely over approximating the area. This is just what ti is. That's the approximate distance traveled over a given interval. We've got to add those up to find the total area, to find the total distance traveled as an actual summation. And I call it a RHS standing for right-hand sum, which actually means I misspoke three or four weeks ago when I was talking about differential equations. I think I might have said RHS always stands for right-hand side, and LHS always stands for left-hand side. I misspoke. Because RHS now stands for right-hand sum instead of right-hand side. Approximate total distance, also the approximate total area on the curve, is a summation I goes from one to n of v of ti times delta t. What does that mean? With the summation symbol, which you should have seen in the past, you start at the first value of i, which is i equals 1. Compute v of t1 times delta t. That's this first term here. Then you let i go up by 1 to become i equals 2. And compute v of t2 times delta t. That's the second term right there. Then i would be 3, then 4, then 5. You keep adding more and more products. Finally, the last value of i is the top number there, n. Could be 8, could be 16, could be a million, whatever. The last product, the last area of the last rectangle, would be of tn times of t. It's a right-hand sum because I'm using the right end point of each interval to determine the height of the approximate rectangle. A left-hand sum would use the left end point of each interval. And for an increasing graph like this, the left hand sum would be too small. The first uh, rectangle would actually not be a rectangle, it would be a line, because the height over here is zero. The velocity times zero is zero. The second rectangle would be about like this. The third one would be about like this. Fourth, etc. Add up the areas of these rectangles, you're going to get an approximation that's too small for an increasing function like this. But again, we're going to let n go to infinity. <clears throat> which makes also delta t go to zero. It turns out there is a simplified formula for the right-hand sum in this example. What is that simplified formula? It's that. Where does that come from? I'm not telling you. We'll confirm it with Mathematica here in a minute. But notice that it is a rational function of n. And since there's just an n squared on the bottom, we can actually break it into three fractions that are added. 8n squared over n squared, which is just 8. 12n over n squared, which is 12 over n. And 4 over n squared, which is 4 over n squared and let n go to infinity, what happens? These two terms approach zero. The answer is 8. 8 is the total distance traveled as t goes from 0 to 2. And notice 8 is t cubed. Three, uh, 2 cubed, I should say. 2 cubed. Which was f of, t, f of 2 because f of t was t, t cubed. It's not a proof of the answer is TQ for the distance traveled, but it helps you believe it. If I pick some other thing for B, like 1.5 or 1, say I pick 1.5, I'd get 1.5 cubed for this limit, whatever that turns out to be.
So Mathematica here. This is the same example. We're still talking about the same example. So what do I have here? I've got the velocity function and the position function. I can enter those. In this picture here, I'm graphing more than just the velocity. I'm also graphing the position. The graphs look somewhat similar in, in nature, but they are not the same. This one's a quadratic, that one's a cubic. This one's technically a parabola, that one's technically not, even though it looks like a parabola. I fixed t to be 1.3 here. I showed you this kind of picture last time. This is the velocity or speed in this case because it's positive. The area under that is going to give you the distance traveled. Same as position if I start at position zero. What is that area? It's 1.3 cubed. Second coordinate at this point. This is the position function. It's about 2.2. If you do 1.3 cubed on your calculator, you'll get about 2.2. You can give it a try right now if you want. So the area under the velocity curve, about 2.2 there, is the value of the position function. And also, by the way, notice you could estimate the area using those, these little rectangles, boxes. I call them the Google when you're doing your homework for today, as you should have. We can approximate this area to be 2.2 by counting boxes under this curve, or in partial boxes. Each box has a base of 1 and a height of 1, actually. If I made the, sc the scales on the axes the same, they'd actually be squares. These are partial boxes, not full boxes. Each of area perhaps about uh, 0.3 or something. Well, yeah, I guess that would make sense. 0.3, because this is 1.3 right there. 0.1. 0.3 plus 0.3 plus 0.3 is 0.9. That might be another 0.2 or so, it could bring you up to 1 or so. 1.1, 1.2. Evidently, this area here adds up to close to 1 or so. That's close to 0.5 or 0.6 maybe. This is close to 0.3 or 0.4. This is close to 0.1 or something like in the ballpark to get you to a total area close to 2.2. And that is the second coordinate of the distance travel. At t is 1.3. And I can go back the other way, which is what we've always done before this point. You got the distance traveled, take its derivative to find the speed. The derivative is the slope. When t is 1.3, the slope there is about 5.1 of that tangent. And that's also the value of the speed at if t equals 1.3. The second coordinate of this point is about 5.1. Same as the slope of this red line section. If you go back. And we can also emphasize the fact that you could change t. And the rela no matter what you pick for t, the relationship still holds. This is your velocity graph or your speed graph. I'm saying both because it's positive velocity. <coughs> it can be thought of either way. The area under it from 0 up to and some arbitrary t is t cubed, which is the distance trap. Same as position. Coordinates of this point are t, 3t squared, because the formula is 3t squared. Coming back here, this is your distance drop. At an arbitrary value of t, its derivative will be the speed. The slope of this red line is 3t squared, which is the speed, 3t squared. Okay, this relationship always holds. And one key thing I want you to see here is if I let, if I play the animation, let time go by, so to speak. The reason the graph on the right keeps going higher and higher is because the area under this graph keeps getting bigger and bigger. And in fact, this graph is concave up because this graph is increasing. The area is being accumulated faster and faster when this graph is high. This is all related to the fundamental theorem. why it's stolen here. 
We can use mathematically to do the Riemann sums as well. This is not something that I'm going to expect you to have to be able to do for the test or say how to do for the test, but this is code that will do the sums. A is 0, B is 2. This is delta T, and it's really a function of n. Here's really ti, I'm calling it t point for a reason I won't get into, sub i of n. That's really ti, t sub i. And here's a right hand sum, rhs of n. I'm adding up products v of ti times delta t. And I can approximate those. This makes a nice little table of approximate areas of a bunch of rectangles. When n is 10, 20, 30, etc., up through 100, you can see the numbers for the areas going toward 8. It has a limit of 8. As n goes to infinity. And they're all too big because we're doing those right-hand sums where the areas were above the graph. They're all too big. We can also put this in mani manipulate if we want and let n go bigger. I want it to go up to 1,000 here. And you can see the second numbers getting really close to 8. I can also have Mathematica compute that formula that I had in the PowerPoint. Though it does not expand the top, I can expand the top here. There's the 4 plus 12n plus 8n squared, which you do divide by n squared as well, and that's why you break it apart into the sum of three fractions, 8 or I guess I had the opposite order. 8 over n squared was 8. 12n over n squared was 12 over n over n. And 4 over n squared is 4 over n squared. You can take the limit of that as n goes to infinity, 8. You can even plot the right-hand side values in what's called a discrete plot. A little hard to see there, but here's 8. Here's a bunch of right-hand sum values. You can see they're going toward 8 as n gets bigger. You can also think of those right-hand, of uh, those triangles, or excuse me, those rectangles as being area under another graph, the graph of a step function. Not the greatest integer function, but a different step function, where the graph of the step function just comes from the top of these rectangles for any fixed value then. And is 8 in my picture on the board? And is 4 in this picture? We've got 4 rectangles. I can even animate this to see the rectangles getting closer and closer to the true area. And in the limit as n goes to infinity, really, really in the limit as n goes to infinity, it defines the area. Almost at least. There's some other, other subtleties that I'm not talking about. But essentially, the limit as n goes to infinity defines what the area is, and you can compute it to be 8. A couple more minutes, then we'll take, our, we'll take our break here. Let's finish this slide. The limit of this rational function of n as n goes to infinity can be found to be 8. Using knowledge we had back when we were doing chapter one. If you look at this kind of thing, you can see as n goes to infinity, these two things go to zero, that goes to eight. Also, as a rational function, the degree of the top and the bottom are the same, too, right? Look at the ratio of the coefficients of those highest powers, eight and one. Eight divided by one is eight. You can also use L'Hopital's rule in this situation. If n is imagined to be a continuous variable, you can take the limit as n goes to infinity with L'Hopital's rule. But this is a different kind of L'Hopital's rule because it's not a 0 over 0 in determining form when you look here. The top and the bottom are not both going to 0. n is not approaching a specific number. It's going to infinity. But it turns out you still can use a different form of L'Hopital's rule to confirm the answer is 8. And here's the work. If you think of the top function as having, uh, of this rational function as being called g of n and the bottom being h of n, so g of n is 
8 n squared plus 12 n plus 4, and h of n is n squared. This is called an infinity over infinity in determinant form. That's worth writing down. By the way, that's not indeterminate. Uh, it's not indeterminate. It's not like, like a matrix determinant. It's indeterminate. I have still. That's another situation where you can use L'Hopital's rule. Now you can't write G prime of infinity divided by H prime of infinity. You have to let N go to infinity. <coughs> if you take the derivative of the top, you get 16N plus 12, exactly what you see there. Take the derivative of the bottom, you get 2N, exactly what you see there. This is not the quotient. Don't ever, ever think this is the quotient. It's different. This is still infinity over infinity. And infinity over infinity in determinant form. Apply the Lopitol's rule again. Take the derivative of the top and the bottom of these of this fraction, giving you the second derivative of the top and the bottom of the original. The derivative of 16n plus 12 is 16. The derivative of 2n is 2. Hey, 16 over 2 is 8. Doesn't depend on n. L'Hopital's rule, a different version, to, can apply to this situation. And here's our picture. Let's take a break.